So just a quick update of what actually went down last week. So starting on Monday, um, so pretty much on Monday, we, we basically had more of the, how can I put it, more of the geopolitical tensions updates uh, where we saw Ikata Energy, where they, they actually paused in terms of moving their ships are, are, are along the Red Sea. Uh, we also saw a US-owned dry, dry bulk ship, which was also struck by a, a missile from the Houthis. Uh, we also saw the Islamic Revolu Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, a branch of the Iranian armed forces uh, that actually fired several missiles uh, that were also shot down by, by actually, actually shot down before hitting the U.S. base at, at Erbil Airport. You know, so it was more of a lot of escalations uh, in the Middle East. Uh, but then we also had China, MLF, uh, of which it was left unchanged. Uh, the, that's the medium term lending facility. Essentially, it's interest rates charged by central banks to um, uh, commercial banks. So whenever they offer a loan to commercial banks, that's the interest rate that they charge. So they, there was also a downer for, for, for market participants because they were expecting a rate cut uh, from 2.5 to 2.4%, but that did not happen, right? So there, it was a disappointment there. Then Tuesday, uh, let's just focus more on the UK employment here. So it was it was left unchanged at 4.2, but then we saw that it actually went lower in terms of uh, wage growth was expected at 6.6. Uh, sorry, wage growth came in at 6.6 uh, and previously it was a 7.2. So that actually boosted the case for a sharper drop in inflation because if uh, we're seeing wage growth going lower, then that means that it won't feed into inflation. And then that means that it won't really push inflation expectations higher, right? But essentially, the job vacancies and workers on payroll declined, supporting a case for a Bank of England pivot to rate cuts, right? And then okay. on the same day, we also had Canada, uh, Canada CPI, uh, where we saw um, it came in essentially higher than expected for inflation, for inflation. So a lack of progress in the Bank of Canada's preferred core measure of inflation which is CPI trimmed, which surprised higher, 3.7 versus uh, 3.5 expected, and CPI median, which came in at 3.6 as expected, they can place expectations of a rate cut on hold. So essentially, inflation came in greater than expected. What does that mean? That means that the fight is not yet over, so the central bank cannot relax yet, or the Bank of Canada cannot relax yet, so they need to keep interest rates higher for longer until they see another what another sub sub in, until they see inflation pressure starting to subside again because most importantly core inflation which is uh the cpi trimmed measure that surprised higher right so that is the one that they specifically pay most attention to they pay most attention to all inflation figures but specifically for the bank of canada it is the cpi trimmed right uh, or core cpi trimmed and that actually came in higher than expected. So essentially, it's not confirming my um, interest rate cuts, but it's slightly pushing them further into the future. That is what we got there. Yes. And then when it comes to China, we had uh, GDP, which came in, well, the numbers were not so good. Uh, unemployment increased to 5.1 from 5.5. Retail sales fell to 7.4 versus 8%, which was expected. New home prices also dropped. Uh, so it essentially... When it comes to new home prices, they dropped to negative 0.4 from 0.2% previously. That's on a monthly change. Uh, so that was also signaling a property, a continued property downturn. And of course, that was bearish for China. So essentially, if you're looking at last week, we had interest rate decision, MLF interest rate decision on Monday for China. And then Tuesday, we had, sorry, not Tuesday, Wednesday, we had uh, GDP, which came in poor unemployment, ticked higher, retail sales fail fell lower, sorry. So that means that, so those are not positive things for the Chinese economy, right? So essentially, those are bearish things for the Chinese economy. Then if you look at same day on Wednesday, we also had uh, inflation for the for the, for the the United Kingdom. And uh, remember, we had the previous, previously we had what? Unemployment figures, uh, of where we saw wage growth decreasing, unemployment remaining unchanged. But when it came to, to inflation, inflation actually came in higher than expected. So, Similar to what we saw with the Bank of Canada, if inflation comes in higher than expected, then it means that it's not yet just going straight down. So that that in a way, not to say it will push the central bank to hike, but it means that it won't apply pressure on them to start cutting interest rates. I think that is clear. Yeah, 
yeah, good. If inflation is not subsiding, then they should. There's no pressure on them to what to con to cut interest rates. So essentially, inflation inflation uh, figures for the UK surprised higher. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, inflation figures, inflation figures for for the UK. Oh, okay, so we have uh, okay. Someone else just joined now. Uh, but as I was saying. So he will, he will just catch up as we go along. So as I was saying, on Wednesday, we had China. Of course, uh, the data was not good as well. And on, also on Monday, uh, because they did not hike as expected, UK CPI came in greater than expected. So similar to the Bank of Canada. But in this case, the Bank of Canada CPI trimmed is what they pay most attention to. When it comes to the UK economy, the, the Bank of England, they pay more attention to all inflation figures, but most attention to the services inflation, of which services inflation edged higher as well to 6.4 from 6.3. Services account for about 47% of the UK CPI. So all the data points to a sticky inflation, which will push back rate cut expectations and only make the job harder for the Bank of England, right? So like I said, that is bullish the bank of or, or the GBP. So like you said, uh, see how that you understand and make sense. So we're gonna we're gonna move for, forward from that. And then when it comes to US retail sales, um, how's it, Nick? I'm good and you sir. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, so we'll just catch up as we as we move along because we had already started. We just going over what happened last week. As you can see, 17th, is, that was on Wednesday. So I'll just continue yeah. and then you'll just uh, pick up as we move along. All right, all right. Okay. Uh, so that is what we had uh, when it comes to UK inflation on, on, um, on Wednesday. And then we had US retail sales. Uh, those came in greater than expected both on a monthly figure and also on a year-to-year -year figure, this supports the USD bullishness as it shows a resilient consumer. Because remember, when it comes to consumer spending or consumer consumption, we have consumer confidence and then we have also retail sales. All those things contribute to GDP. So if retail sales start falling, they're contributing to what? Negatively to GDP, right? If uh, consumer confidence starts falling, that's going to contribute negatively to GDP overall because we understand that if consumers are spending, that's going to push growth higher, right? If consumers are confident, they'll be willing to spend money, right? But if they're not confident and they're also not spending money and we're seeing a drop in retail sales, that's negative for their economy because it will feed negatively to GDP as well. So the case of the US retail sales were good. Then on uh, Thursday, we had Australia unemployment, uh, of which uh, it came in unchanged at 3.9, but then employment change fell negative 65k versus 17k expected right so that's a huge loss in employment so that also not painting a good picture for the labor market showing that it is not as tight as it appeared to be uh so that will obviously lower inflationary pressures right so if it lowers inflationary pressures it won't push the central bank or the bank of australia or reserve bank of australia to be specific to what to keep interest rates higher or to start cutting interest rates so that is what we have there and then if we if we move on, okay, this was also more geopolitical, adding more to the geopolitical space, so I won't really go much into it, but freight rates have more than doubled since December, and this can create inflationary pressures if it escalates further, right? And this bolsters uh, the case of a sour risk sentiment. By sour risk sentiment, I mean a risk of sentiment, where in that case we'll see um, currencies or asset classes that are safe haven asset classes like gold, uh, CHF uh, bonds, we could see those appreciate in value or we could see more buying of those asset classes, right? But in this particular case of the geopolitical or the Middle East, uh, oil will also benefit, right? Because well, some of the countries, they're huge exporters of oil. So oil will also benefit if, if, escalate, if the tensions escalate even further, of which judging by what I know today, they have actually escalated further. Uh, we've seen more of, of of we've seen more attacks in 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 the in the in the U.S. base or air base, which is based in Iraq. So yeah, so tensions are escalating, right? And uh, like a, a a risk sentiment that is risk off. Uh, at this point, from where I'm standing, I'm viewing that it's it's imminent. It will happen eventually. It's just a matter of when, right? But tensions are escalating. Then. We also had U.S. building permits, which came in better than expected. U.S. initial jobless claims also, that came in better than expected. So this still 
builds or strengthens the case that the US the US economy is resilient. It doesn't mean everything is going good for the US economy, but some of the data points, they're still showing some strength or resiliency, right? So initial jobless claims, essentially, it comes out every week, but it means initial jobless means that persons who are filing for unemployment for the first time, right? So if there is increasing, that means that more people are losing jobs because that is what initial jobless claims means. And then continuing claims means people who are continually filing for unemployment claims or unemployment benefits. For example, like in South Africa, we could say UIF, you see? So in Deganjal, you can look at it in that way. So if initial jobless claims are, are continuing are continually increasing that will mean that unemployment or more people are getting laid off and then we could see that feed into what into the unemployment figure as it ticks up but as you can see jobless claims in, in america have have actually been coming in less than what was expected so pointing to a tight labor economy or or, or, or unemployment uh, or employment uh, data so they're obviously being bullish for the dollar and then lastly, on Friday, we had Japan inflation, which came in. Uh, yeah, it was very poor. <laughs> it was very, very poor. So core inflation slowed for the second month, taking pressure off the Bank of Japan and pointing to inflation not stably being above target. Earlier in the month, we had weak wage data from Japan and this weakness. And this weakens our case of a potential outperformance from the JPY in 2024 and less wage wage negotiations yield a positive outcome so this is bearish for the jpy so obviously and like i'd said we are we are looking to buy the japanese yen in 2024 but of course based on what we're getting from the data because if you look at inflation especially specifically core because that is what the, the bank of japan are focusing yeah. on it's sitting at 2.3 their target is two percent core inflation went up to the highs of close to four percent so now it's sitting at 2.3%. So that is not good because at least if it were double the target, maybe sitting at 4% or maybe slightly above or maybe above 3%, then that would be inflation that is stable above the target. So this does not really pressure the Bank of Japan to shift policy, maybe to hike interest rates or to even maybe maybe slow down in terms of their bond in, in terms of their bond buying program, right? So that does not favor that case. So this is essentially pushing against our expectations of what of what to expect but our only hope at this point is of course the wage negotiations that will be taking place in april and if they yield positive resu results in terms of we, we get a a big wage hike or increase in wages in the in, in the japanese economy then that will obviously feed into inflation because that will mean more people are er people are earning more and then that means that the the, the companies to accommodate for increasing their wages because it will squeeze their profit margins they also need to what to increase their to increase their prices so that they can increase their profit margin and that is how essentially it feeds into inflation so that is what we're now hoping for or maybe if the data improves for the for the japanese economy but then if we're looking at the uk retail sales uh okay those fell sharply uh very very big drop biggest drop since January 2021 very much disappointing even though the same week we had uh, high uh, inflation figures but we also had unemployment which was okay relatively okay but wages were had actually fallen right so this was like a second data point that was negative for the UK and then taking into consideration that this was December figures and you all know that in December that is when most uh, consumers generally spend the most right so but in this case it fell to the it is it was the biggest drop since january 2021 and it points uh it points to a drop in consumer consumption and the squeeze on real income from high interest rates coupled with the high cost of living right so so this heightens this the stick the stagflation risks in the uk as cpi came in hot on wednesday so a stagflation essentially means stagnant economy and the inflation while inflation is high right and that is what we're seeing in terms of GDP in the UK, it's flat. It's essentially in the zero in the zero region, so it's flat. But and but inflation is still high, right? So that causes a stagflation. Or obviously, it also heightens the risk of a recession for the US for the UK economy. So it has not changed my case from what I stated in December that I'm that I'm I am looking to sell the GBP. So this only strengthens that case. Even though we do have inflation that is proving to be uh, stubborn, but yeah, that just uh, strengthens my case to sell uh the uk economy or the or the pound 
Then we have Canada retail sales. They they say they these were neutral essentially. Yes, they dropped, but it's essentially neutral. Not really that much of 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 an impact on the Canadian economy. Then lastly on Friday we had the University of Michigan consumer sentiment. Uh, this came in greater than expected at 78.8. Expectations were for an increase to 70 from 69.7. So that was pretty good for the U.S. Still showing resilience of the U.S. economy. Uh, but what what we also paid attention to was the five-year inflation expectations, which fell to 2.8 from 2.9. One-year inflation expectations fell to 2.9 from 3.1. So in terms of inflation, that will be welcome, right? Because if, if consumers or inflation expectations are dropping, then that also takes the, much of the pressure off the Fed to do what to keep rates higher for longer. And then they might look to continue to actually continue pivoting and uh, cutting interest rates because inflation expectations are also on the falling as well as inflation as we saw it uh, also declining after the peak of 9.1% uh, in, um, it was in June, I think June, 2022. So it has been falling since, right? So that is essentially what we had last week, just an update, but it hasn't changed much of, a, much of the picture. Maybe I'd say what it has dented is our is our bias on the on the JPY. It, it weakened our bias uh, because we had wage growth that was that was disappointing, inflation that was disappointing. So yeah, that really did not strengthen our case. But in terms of shifting bias altogether, no, it hasn't changed at all, right? So any questions on that? No, it's pretty clear on my end. But... Nick, from your side? Yeah, it's clear. It's clear. Okay. So that is what we had there. And then when it comes to, to the economic calendar, essentially for this week, uh, we have four or five, five uh, central bank meetings. Tomorrow, which is Monday, we'll have the Chinese economy with their LPR or loan prime rate one year loan prime rate uh, and also the five year loan one year loan prime rate essentially refers to loans that are given to consumers and businesses five year it's basically mortgage right mortgage bonds but essentially those are expected to remain unchanged if they cut them i think it would be it would boost the chinese currency because the chinese economy is not doing so good and a and a loosening of policy would really help cutting of interest rates or maybe stimulating the economy uh, that would really help the, the Chinese economy a lot. So, but essentially that is the highlight for tomorrow. We do have a composite as well as services PMI for New Zealand. That will also pay attention to, but mostly predominantly the focus will be on China, right? And then on Tuesday, we have the Bank of Japan interest rate decision. Like what I've just stated with what happened last week, I'm not expecting much of a change here from the Japanese economy because not expecting them to, to shift policy and start hiking interest rates. Maybe we might get a yield curve control uh, shift because remember, currently the ceiling is at 1%. It moved from 0 0.25 to 0 0.5. Now it's at 1%. The yield curve con control is essentially, they are controlling the 10-year yield or the 10-year interest rate. So whenever it get, it pushes up to 1%, they start buying bonds or 10-year bonds. And then that raises the price of bonds and then yields go lower. Because remember, bonds and yields go in the opposite direction. So that is why it's called yield curve control. They're controlling the 10-year yield or the 10-year interest rate at uh, 1%. Maybe if they tweak that and they move the ceiling from 1% to 1.5, then that could be seen as a positive sign of heading in the direction of maybe eventually uh, tightening uh, uh, financial conditions by hiking interest rate. But I'm not expecting much uh, on Tuesday when it comes to the Bank of Japan interest rate decision. Then we also have more data there. We also have inflation as well uh, for, for New Zealand, which we also need to pay attention to, which is expected to drop to 4.7. So we'll also be paying attention to that. Then Wednesday, we have a couple of uh, interest rate decisions. Uh, we actually have one but we also have South Africa inflation that is expected to drop to 5.3 from 5.5 core expected to remain at 4.5 unchanged. So that is still within our five to 6% target range for the South African reserve bank. So that really shouldn't hurt unless if, if it comes in higher, if it comes in less, then that will be, that will boost the, the South African rent, right? Uh, sorry, that would, that would cause the South African rent to drop because that would, boost the case of that the South African Reserve Bank is not pressured to hike interest rates. Uh, and then we'll have more data that is important, but I just want to focus more on the interest rate decisions. Then we have Canada. Canada is expected to remain unchanged at 5%. We saw inflation 
ticked higher or it's surprised higher. Retail sales were not really that bad. So I think it, yeah, it serves the case that they will hold. We're not expecting them to cut interest rates, obviously not, also not expecting them to hike, but to remain unchanged at 5%. So all the data that we've gotten actually supports that case, right? And then uh, Thursday, we have South Africa interest rate expected to remain unchanged at 8.25%. And then of course, on Wednesday, we'll have uh, inflation. I don't think it will affect uh, the decision that much if, if it comes in higher or comes in less, but uh, a hold on, on interest rates is expected from the South African Reserve Bank. Then followed shortly, we'll have the ECP interest rate decision expected to remain unchanged at 4.5. The Euro for me is in the same boat as the pound, right? So I'm not bullish, I'm actually bearish on them. And I'm not really looking to buy the euro or the UK economy, right? And then we'll also have US GDP, uh, quarter, fourth quarter GDP. Uh, that is expected to drop to 2% from 4.9 in the third quarter. So if we do get a greater than the 2% that is expected, that obviously will be bullish for the dollar. If it's less, then that will be bearish for the dollar, but bullish for, bullish for equities or indices, uh, because that would mean that Growth is not that strong, so they definitely need to cut interest rates and that should support indices, right? So that is what we'll have on Thursday. And then Friday, we'll have, uh, we'll have, um, okay, we have consumer confidence as well for Germany, US PCE. So this is the most important as well. US PCE, core PCE, we'll be focusing on the core PCE price index as well as the core PCE price index here over here. The reason why we're focusing more on this is because this is the preferred measure for the Fed, right? So if I click on it and if it opens, we'll be able to see. So this is an inflation measure that is preferred by the, the, the Federal Reserve, right? Even if we go and read here, uh, the core PCE is the Fed's preferred preferred inflation measure, right? The central bank has a 2% target. So if we're seeing a drop in PCE, that will also boost um, uh, indices, your NASDAQ US 30 or, or S&P 500, we'll see those go higher because if PCE is falling, sorry, that will mean that it's taking off the pressure to hike interest rates because it will mean inflation is, fall, is falling, right? So, and this is what the Fed focuses on the most. The same that we have UK focusing most on services inflation, Bank of Canada focusing more on CPI trimmed, Bank of Japan focusing more on core inflation. For the Fed, it is the PCE. So that is why the PCE is very important or will be the highlight for Friday, right? And uh, essentially, yeah, that is what we have in terms of what we're expecting for the week to come. And like I said, geopolitical side, things are escalating. Uh, we are having, we are having, at, we've also had an, more attacks from Israel, mis missiles from Israel that were launched and in, to Syria or headed to Syria. And then I think they killed some, Iranian military group or something. So that might also escalate uh, the tensions further and result in a regional war, right? But essentially, that is what we have for the upcoming week. Any questions there? No, no questions, no questions. No questions, all right. So before we wrap uh, so, up. Uh, yeah. So what, what I would like to know is, uh, is it a wise uh, idea to ignore the low impact and the medium impact news or no it's not it's not it's not it's not it's not to 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 ignore them okay it's not to ignore the medium and the low impact but essentially we need to understand how those news or those data that data affects market expectations moving forward which is why i focused mostly on those ones because those affect market expectations moving forward right yes high impact data you pay attention to it but what really moves the data is how much of a, of how much of weight it has, right? In terms of affecting yeah. decisions or future decisions for that specific economy. So that is why I focused mostly on those. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the the, the other thing is, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I understand some things now in uh, in your explanations, but uh, do you have a recommendation? Let's say, for example, books we must read from Pekina because. Honestly speaking, I don't really, 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 really understand economics to your level. So yeah. uh, 
I would like okay. to know uh, where to start. Uh, no, uh, yeah. uh, okay, no, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a DM. Uh, but essentially, you can start on my YouTube. There's a video there I'll send where I break down inflation, GDP, yeah. and interest rates and how they all work together. I think that is the foundation. If you understand that one, then everything else will yeah. start making sense. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, thanks. Okay. So essentially, then we've had, of course, indices hitting new highs because there are expectations that the Fed will start cutting interest rates sooner. And then that is what we had, especially after the five-year inflation expectations fell on Friday. That is when we saw that strong push higher because it meant that inflation expectations are going lower. So then interest rates should follow suit, right? But when it comes to here, yeah, I just want to focus more on gold as well as silver. So looking at gold and silver, um, looking, I'm look, I'm look this week essentially I'm looking at gold and silver, looking to potentially buy silver as well as gold. And obviously it's tied more to the geopolitical tensions. And then obviously if we get more data that is supporting bearishness of the dollar, then obviously we'll see it support or the gold. We'll see gold rising higher, right? So essentially, yeah, that's all I have uh, when it comes to the technical side of things. Uh, any questions? I know what I was going to do. Okay. No. Then no. Okay. So, so you, you say, yeah. So you say you say uh, the the introductory stuff to economics. You have them in your in your YouTube channel. Yeah. No. I'll 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 send you a DM the DM uh, and and I'll and I'll di direct you to those sources. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, then I, I think we'll wrap it up for this week uh, and then we'll meet again same time, same place uh, on Sunday. Okay, bro. Okay. Okay. okay, thanks. Thank you so much for the updates. Okay, okay. Not a problem. Cheers.